and welcome to American Catholic History, brought to you by the support of listeners like you. If you value this content and wish to see it continue, become a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. We start once again with a word of thanks to our supporters, especially Nicely P., Paul B., James M., Renee Ann Sharman, Catherine S., and N.C. Golesh. Thank you all. Yes, your support makes this podcast possible, and we continue to ask for more. We're only about 20% of the way to the amount of support we need to really make this podcast a sustainable project. So if you've enjoyed these episodes, if you've learned something, if you've been inspired or edified or helped in your faith, please consider becoming a supporter. You can learn about our support tiers at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. The lowest is just $5 each month just $5. But for more each month, you'll get extra perks. So that said, and thank you for your support, on with the show. Today we're talking about a different kind of founding father, St. Junipero Serra, who is a Franciscan friar with a single-minded devotion to evangelization and missionary work. This single-minded devotion brought about great good, though sometimes his tactics were seen as extreme and even a bit harsh by others. But he was driven by love of Christ. To him, no earthly cost was too extreme if it meant growing closer to Christ. Others may have disagreed, but that wasn't his fault. And it's hard to argue with the results. Thousands of natives baptized a huge swath of land from San Francisco down to just south of the Mexican border, evangelized and civilized, and a legacy that includes bringing grapevines into California for the first time. He truly is the father of California. Yes, indeed. And the grapes that he brought to sit to the San Diego area have earned him the title not only of father of California, but also father of California wine, which may be more important. <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah. But let's tell his story. He was born on Majorca, an island off the coast of Spain, in November of 1713. His parents were pious Catholics, and he was baptized Miguel Jose. His parents were farmers, and they weren't well off. They weren't destitute. They just weren't wealthy. He went to a school run by Franciscans, and at 15, he felt a call to become a priest, so he entered the Franciscan novitiate there in Mallorca in 1730 when he was 16. He took the name Junipero after one of St. Francis's earliest companions. He was an excellent student. He was ordained a priest in the late 1730s and earned his doctorate in 1742. He was considered a brilliant scholar and had a long and distinguished career ahead of him as a teacher and thinker. But he felt a different call. In 1748, he and a friend and fellow Franciscan friar, Francisco Palo, confided to one another their secret desire to go off and be missionaries. So they applied for permission, received it, and they set sail from Cadiz, arriving in Veracruz, New Spain, in 1749. Sarah was 35 by this point. That's middle age in this era. He's no spring chicken by missionary standards. But he was devoted to it, so he went. Veracruz on the Gulf Coast was a 250-mile trek from their destination, Mexico City. Horses were available, but Junipero and Francisco refused them, opting to walk. Junipero vowed never to ride on a horse, since this was a rule given them by St. Francis himself. This choice would have an impact on the rest of his life. Early in their walking journey, Sarah was bit by something, a mosquito perhaps, on his left leg around the ankle. The bite became inflamed and infected and caused significant swelling in his foot and lower leg. They stopped at a farm for lodging that night, and the severe burning and itching of his leg compelled them to stay a second night. The pain subsided enough to allow him to complete the journey, but the infection bothered him for the rest of his life. Arriving in Mexico City, he took up residence in the College of San Fernando de Mexico, the school for the Franciscans sent out to be missionaries. While living there, he insisted on living as one of the novices, taking a turn reading to the brothers during the common meals, waiting at table, and serving food. It's a sign of things to come. He lived a life of service and self-denial. He really did. His first mission activity took him north of Mexico City into the Sierra Gorda region where he and Father Francisco walked into a mess. The natives who had become Christian had basically stopped practicing the faith and the Spanish military and colonists had been riding roughshod over the rights of the natives. 
Yes, since the early 1740s, the military had moved into the area and established a base of operations there, bringing their families. So they established ranches and even towns. They didn't quite enslave the native people, known as the Pamas, but they forced them to work their land for very low wages. Sarah was outraged by this and protested the ill treatment. He had brought seeds and implements to help the Pames learn modern farming techniques and livestock to help them establish their own ranching. He came to help them know their faith better and to improve their economic condition. But so long as the Spanish colonists were violating the Pames' land, his efforts couldn't take root. So he protested to the viceroy, citing the laws of the Indies, which forbade colonization on land set aside for missionary activity. The viceroy ruled in his and the Pamas's favor, but it still took a few years for the colonists to vacate. They finally did, leaving Sarah and Father Francisco to finally have their impact. By the time they left, the Pames were in a much better situation, and they had a beautiful church of their own, built over seven years under the direction of Father Serra. In 1758, he returned to San Fernando back in Mexico City to work mainly in the administrative offices of the college. He remained there for nine years. In 1767, a rather significant event occurred in the Spanish Empire. King Charles III expelled the Jesuits. In the edict he issued, he ordered the authorities in New Spain to take the Jesuits by force and remove them immediately from their houses, and he ordered that this be done within 24 hours of the edict being read. To emphasize how serious he was, he said that if any Jesuits were found within the realm after that 24-hour window, even if they were sick or dying, the people who failed to remove them would be executed. Pretty severe. Uh, Yeah. Now, we could do a whole episode on the expulsion and suppression of the Jesuits. It's a fascinating topic, but it's not one that really fits into our category. Well, we have mentioned it before, especially in regard to John Carroll. He was a Jesuit and was teaching in France when the Jesuits were suppressed, so he had to return home to Maryland. And what a boon that was for the church in the U.S., our first bishop and a truly great man, forced to come back home. And... Here, in our story, is another place where the suppression of the Jesuits had a significant impact on what is now the U.S. Yeah, that happened because the Jesuits were in control of the missions of Baja, California, and the far northwest corner of present-day Mexico. When they were forcibly removed, those missions suddenly needed new leadership. And Junipero Serra was the man for the job. He was 53 at this point, and his legs still bothered him badly. He also was still prone to extreme acts of penance, including wearing a hair shirt and practicing self-flagellation to ward off sinful thoughts, among other rather harsh physical penances. But in spite of any weakening these penances caused, he accepted the position of president of the missions, and in 1767 headed to the Baja California Peninsula with 14 other Franciscans to fill the void left by the departed Jesuits. They arrived in Loreto, the main Spanish town on Baja, California, where they were given charge of the church, but the local military governor retained control of the town and everything else. The military took control when the Jesuits were expelled, and they weren't keen on relinquishing control. Once again, Sarah had to write back to Mexico City to get his rights. Once again, the viceroy sided with him, and the military governor had to give over control of everything to the mission, and therefore to Sarah. But his stay at Loretta would not be long. The new civilian head of matters in California, both Baja or Lower California and Alta or Upper California, desired to set out to establish missions and military settlements further north. Spanish explorers had by this point mapped much of the coast of Alta California, the modern-day U.S. state of California. They had come upon both San Diego Bay and Monterey Bay, giving both their names, names which remain to this day. But those explorers did not have the manpower or supply lines to establish permanent settlements. That was left to overland expeditions. And Sarah was personally eager to be part of those missions into previously unevangelized, uncivilized territory. But his bad leg flared up. Badly. So badly that even his dear friend and longtime companion, Father Francesco, encouraged him to remain behind and allow younger and healthier friars like himself to take on this journey. Father Sarah would not hear of it. He said to Paolo, Let us not speak of that. I have placed all my confidence in God, of whose goodness I hope that he will grant me to reach not only San Diego, to raise the standard of the Holy Cross in that port 
but also Monterey. And with that, he was going. But he didn't set off by boat with the rest of them. He instead hopped on a mule and headed north along the arid peninsula. Now, for perspective, Loretto is about two-thirds of the way down the peninsula. It's more than 500 miles from Loretto to modern-day Tijuana, which is just a little way south of San Diego. And he did it by mule. Also, he didn't go straight there. About halfway along his journey, he met up with the rest of the crew that had set out by ship. And in an area known as Veliquita, Father Serra established his first mission. The original mission church was little more than a mud hut, and there weren't many natives nearby initially. But they established the mission, and soon the natives did come. After some time, Sarah and the majority of the crew set off, leaving one friar and some of the men at Velikata to carry on the work of evangelizing the natives there. But Sarah's condition was as bad as ever. The disease of his leg had spread from his foot all the way to his knee, making walking very painful. Once again, the leaders of the crew implored him to stay behind, and once again he refused, saying that if it were God's will that he died on the journey, then so be it. He would be fine with being buried among the pagans. So with him hobbling along and riding his feeble mule, they continued north. They encountered more natives as they neared the Pacific coast. These encounters with natives were very pleasant, but they pressed on for San Diego Bay, finally arriving on July 1st, 1769. Naturally, this was an occasion for much celebration. Fifteen days later, he established the Mission San Diego de Alcala, named in honor of St. Didicus of Alcala. However, unlike at Vericata and unlike the natives they had met along the way, natives around San Diego were not kindly. Not only did they steal from the Spanish, but they even attacked the camp. The soldiers present, aided by some of the civilians, managed to repel the attack. Muskets and pistols versus bow and arrow and throwing spear really do make a difference. Yeah. So, needless to say, these natives were not as open to evangelization and conversion as others they had met. But finally, one native boy who had warmed to the friars was able to serve as an envoy and some baptisms took place but even those were hard to come by and the natives still reacted with fear sarah attributed this difficulty to his own sinfulness and he probably imposed an additional penance on himself well of course as one does Hmm. yeah Food supplies began to dwindle at the mission in early 1770. A supply ship was expected but was delayed, and the situation was becoming bleak. The leader of the military detachment set a March 19th deadline for the ship to appear. If it did not, he would march the soldiers south rather than let them stay put and starve to death. Sarah objected, but the military commander remained firm. On the morning of March 19th, the Solemnity of St. Joseph, of course, Father Sarah offered Mass. No ship appeared for the entire morning, but as they were giving up hope, at 3 p.m. there emerged over the horizon the masts and sails of the San Antonio. The mission was saved. Shortly thereafter, Sarah and a bunch of the crew moved on once again, leaving behind a friar and enough support crew to maintain Mission San Diego de Alcala. Their destination this time was Monterey Bay and the Monterey Peninsula. And this time, Sarah didn't walk or take a mule. He boarded the San Antonio and went by ship. Seems a smart move, right? Well, not so much in this case. Yeah, no. This was almost a Jonah and the whale sort of a thing. The crew that did go overland the many hundreds of miles arrived a full week before the crew aboard the San Antonio because of strong winds that blew in every direction but north. It took the San Antonio six weeks to make the journey, which should have been much shorter than that. A number of the crew fell ill with scurvy. Sarah, for his part, described the journey as mildly uncomfortable. (laughs) Right, of course. Of course, yeah. (laughs) Once at Monterey, Sarah established the Mission San Carlos Borromeo, named in honor of the patron saint of the King of Spain, Charles III. This mission was established originally near Monterey Bay, but was soon moved to the village of Carmel further inland to be nearer the Indian villages and in a better place for farming. Mission San Carlos Borromeo there in Carmel became Sarah's home base and headquarters for the rest of his life. He only returned to Mexico City once more in his lifetime, and that was a very important trip, which we'll talk about shortly. 
But to wrap up the narrative, from this base, he would personally go out and found seven more missions over the next 12 years. Mission San Antonio de Padua, San Gabriel Arcangel, San Luis Obispo de Tolosa, San Juan Capistrano, San Francisco de Assis, Santa Clara de Assis, and San Buenaventura. And if you notice the names of some prominent California cities in there, that's because... Well, there are some. He's not called the father of California for nothing. These missions were significant, and the towns grew up around them. Also, an interesting thing to note is the time frame when these missions were founded. They were founded between 1769 and 1782. So that means that the entire period when the likes of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Samuel Adams, James Madison, Ben Franklin, and company were changing the world on the eastern seaboard of this continent, a band of friars led by Junipero Serra, were bringing Christianity and civilization to the western seaboard. Right, because the work of these missions wasn't just to evangelize. They did that, and they did it well. But they also were bringing more advanced farming techniques, ranching, and other more advanced technologies to places that still lived in very primitive conditions. Yes, the Spanish Empire sent the military with the friars up the West Coast in part because they viewed the evangelization of the natives as part of their reason for being. As a Catholic empire, they were charged to spread the faith. But they also had some secular reasons. Right. They also had concerns that the Russian Empire was threatening to come down the west coast of the continent from their territories in Alaska. So going up the west coast was also in part to check Russian expansion southward. And because the Spanish Empire was also operating according to these more earthly motivations, they also had a more earthly way of dealing with the natives. On more than one occasion, Sarah protested against ill treatment of the natives by the Spanish soldiers. Yes, and this brings us to that one and only time he returned to Mexico City. He went explicitly to lodge a formal complaint against the military commander, Pedro Fages, who was governor of the California Territory. Sarah insisted that Fages must be removed as governor due to his very ill treatment of the natives. Sarah wrote out 32 formal complaints against Fages and argued his case before the Viceroy. The Viceroy was convinced, and Fages was removed. Regardless of how any of the Spanish military authorities viewed the natives, to Sarah they were hijos de Dios, children of God. They had their own dignity and deserved to be treated as such. Now, some will argue that some of Sarah's own ways of treating the natives were harsh. He believed in corporal punishment. He required natives who were baptized to move into and live in the mission. He would impose strict penances on converts. To our modern sensibilities in our hypermobile world, with the internet and interstate roadways and with our notions of how things ought to be, some of these practices can be unthinkable. But Sarah didn't live in 21st century America. He lived in 18th century New Spain, and he was in a largely unsettled part of it. He was dealing with people who had never experienced the gospel and its power to transform. And, of course, he was the sort of man who imposed strict penances on himself. So, naturally, he would tend toward imposing them on others who had difficulty controlling their appetites and passions. As for requiring the baptized to live within the mission, that was in part for their own protection, to reduce the chance of relapse, but also to make the point that as a member of the community, they needed to stay within the community for mutual support and aid, spiritual and economic. The missions thrived. Eventually, they were producing surpluses of grain and cattle enough to trade with Mexico for luxury goods. In 1779, friars at San Diego de Alcala established California's first vineyard, using a strain of grapes that would dominate California winemaking for 100 years. In the final three years of his life, Father Serra traveled up and down California, visiting all of his missions, confirming those who had been baptized— He had been granted the faculty to confirm many years before. He was severely hobbled by his chronically bad leg, which had only gotten worse, including open sores from venous ulcers. And by this point, he also suffered from problems in his chest due to a common penance of striking himself on the breast with a rock repeatedly. Ugh. He died on August 28, 1784. He had contracted tuberculosis and, with his already weakened state and advanced age, 
He had lived 70 hard years. He had little ability to fight off the infection. He died at Mission San Carlos Borromeo and was buried under the floor of the sanctuary of the Mission Church. Controversies have swirled around Junipero Serra for some time, but they do not touch the fact that he lived an exemplary life in the service of the Lord. He loved Christ, hated sin, and loved his fellow man so much that he spent himself utterly to bring the message of Christ to those who otherwise would not have heard the gospel. And his life's work is commemorated in the U.S. Capitol, one of California's two statues that stand in Statuary Hall in the U.S. Capitol depicts him in a dramatic posture, preaching while holding aloft a gleaming cross. He was beatified by Pope John Paul II in 1988. In speaking about Sarah, John Paul said, He sowed the seeds of Christian faith amid the momentous changes wrought by the arrival of European settlers in the New World. It was a field of missionary endeavor that required patience, perseverance, and humility, as well as vision and courage. And in 2015, in the first ever canonization on American soil, Pope Francis canonized Junipero Serra, calling him a founding father of the United States. And it is a fitting title, because just as the American Revolution was bringing political independence, to the 13 colonies on the East Coast, the work of Junipero Serra, the humble friar from Majorca, was bringing civilization and a spiritual revolution to the West Coast of what would eventually be the United States. This has been American Catholic History. If you enjoy American Catholic History, please become a supporter. We've got great perks for supporters, including exclusive content, books, mugs, and personal conversations. Get information on how to become a supporter and the perks at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about Junipero Serra, see about our pilgrimages, and find other episodes that you might be interested in. Also, don't forget to check out information about our course starting in mid-October. Yep. We love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. You can email us at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash American Catholic History. On Instagram at ACH underscore podcast. Or follow us on Twitter at ACH 1513. I'm Noel Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, made possible by listeners like you. Music